welcome to the Jesus Talks as we begin a new section looking at the opponents of Jesus. Well, we considered the baptism of Jesus as he was prepared to be a sacrifice as the Lamb of God. As soon as Jesus had been ceremonially washed in that way, he was driven by the Divine Spirit into a confrontation with the devil. So Mark chapter 1 from verse 9 says this, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So when we read the biographies of Jesus, we are inevitably caught up in questions of the Let's call it for the moment supernatural, or some might use the word spiritual. In the Bible itself, we never come across a word like supernatural, because such a word comes from a particular philosophical world. And it seems to suggest that there is something very uh, mundane called nature and then on top of that super to it because the word super means like above so supernatural above nature is another sort of spooky realm of existence so the idea then is that there is nature which is mundane and then super above nature another sort of realm of existence but in the bible itself the heavens and the earth are seen to be much more complex and integrated than anything like that the world as we see it through the eyes of jesus is intrinsically spiritual, meaningful, complex, and the invisible creatures or heavenly creatures, like angels, demons, things like that, they are just as real and relevant as the visible creatures. Now, as children of the modern age, it might be hard for us to recapture that big vision of reality where what a modern person might say there is, you know, the notion of the natural and then the notion of the supernatural. But to imagine all of those as integrated into one big vision of reality where they are fully one thing, that is hard because we have become so used to these much more simplistic ways of looking at the world and we'll say yes there's the world of the sort of facts predictable scientific nature and then anything that falls outside of that that's supernatural and uh, that belongs to faith or theology or religion uh, or imagination and we try to separate out uh, what is more integrated in a biblical sense. I mean, let's, well, let's just begin to focus specifically on the issue of demons and the devil, because that's going to come up in what's going to confront us in the next episode in Jesus's life. So things like the devil or devils, demons, Sigmund Freud who lived from 1856 to 1939. Freud didn't believe in the devil, though he did believe in all kinds of mythical dimensions to the human mind. 
But he said, demons do not exist any more than gods do, being only the products of the psychic activity of man. In a similar vein, but with deeper perception, the Russian Orthodox writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, he lived from 1821 to 1881, Dostoevsky said, if the devil does not exist and man has therefore created him, he's created him in his own image and likeness. But can the devil really be consigned so easily to myth or imagination? The writer and theologian Ronald Knox said, it's so stupid of modern civilization to have given up believing in the devil when he is the only explanation of it. Ah, the devil, the only explanation for modern civilization. Well, the devil and his demonic armies are not the peculiar products of Western European imagination or folklore or a sinister byproduct of uh, Western Christian art or anything like that. The devil, in all his guises and forms and manifestations, well, is present around the world in nearly every culture and religion. The continuities are fascinating. For example, how can it be that the cultures of the world from east to west all know of an ancient, intelligent, talking dragon? When dragons have never been an indigenous species on this planet, have they? Were has this global knowledge of the dragon come from? Well, not everybody is content to simply pretend there's no devil and no forces of darkness. Some people go the other way and are obsessed with the devil and all that they imagine goes with the devil. The worship of death and the devil is really as popular in today's culture as it ever was. There's a whole sort of fashion movement designed to emulate the appearance of a corpse, and that stems from this ancient tradition. In relatively modern time, there was the eccentric occultist Alistair Crowley, who lived from 1875 to 1947, and he plunged headlong into an obsession with the devil that few find appealing, he said, I was not content to believe in a personal devil and serve him in the ordinary sense of the world. I wanted to get hold of him personally and become his chief of staff. Well, if those who ignore the devil are ill-equipped to deal with demonic thinking, then those who obsess about him are in danger of deifying him and attributing every ill and evil to his personal agency. If I can quote the great Calvin, not the 16th century theologian, but the cartoon or comic character, Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin asks, do you believe in the devil, you know, a supreme evil being dedicated to the temptation, corruption and destruction of man? And then his tiger teddy bear thing says, Hobbes says, I'm not sure that man needs the help. Now, although the Bible does not quite go that far, yet the surprising fact is that within the Bible, the devil's strategy works with corrupt human nature rather than against it. You know, the devil works with human nature, not against it. The devil doesn't need to make all the evil happen when human beings are so willing and capable of doing it. Before we go any further, though, we must stop for a moment and consider were this devil, this leader of the armies of darkness came from according to the biblical witness. 
If Jesus is the Lord God whose coming was prophesied from ancient times, then why does he need to confront the devil as the first item on his agenda after he has been washed ceremonially as the priest and sacrifice and then filled with the spirit? The very first thing he does now that he is publicly appointed to the role of what he's going to do, first thing he does is bring about a confrontation with the devil. Where did this devil come from? And how does he have such power in the world? Has the devil always existed as an equal and opposite power to the Lord God? And there have been lots of religions who've thought like that, that good and evil are these sort of opposite sides that eternally exist. Or was the devil some sort of tragic mistake? An early creature with serious design flaws. Well, Jesus does make a reference to the origin of the devil's evil when he was confronting certain religious leaders in John 8 verse 44. He says to these religious people, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, we don't need to get into the reasons why Jesus says such things to the people who were plotting to kill him. But we can note what he says about the devil. Jesus states that the devil was a murderer from the beginning and that he is the father of lies. It's not hard to conclude that Jesus is referring to the story right at the beginning of the Bible when Adam and Eve were tempted by the ancient serpent who both lied to them and orchestrated the deaths and the deaths of all their offspring. Now Jesus doesn't consider the idea that the devil was made evil from the beginning, as if he was created as a force of evil. No, the story that Jesus refers to is woven throughout the ancient Hebrew scriptures. And many people know that the devil is also called Lucifer, meaning the light bringer or the light bearer or the morning star. So this title of the devil is actually derived from an unusual passage in the ancient prophet Isaiah. It's a description of the motivation of the devil when he decided to rebel against his place in the created order. It's about when he became evil. So Isaiah 14 verse 12, it begins where say describing him as the morning star that he once had a place of great honour and light and heavenly elevation, but lost it and was pushed down to the earth. Well, this is what it says, Isaiah 14, from verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star Lucifer, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. So Lucifer believed that although he was a creature, yet he deserved a place alongside the Most High God himself. He believed that he should be raised above the other creatures, the stars of God, and sit on God's throne. In this way, we see that evil is not something that's created, but it's what happens when a good creature turns away from its true 
place and purpose. Darkness. What is darkness? Darkness is nothing but the absence of light. So evil isn't anything in itself. It doesn't get created. Evil is what happens when good uh, is, lo is, is lost or corrupted. Everything that the living God created is good. But when his creatures turn away from him and his life, then it is as if the light is switched off, as if the connection to life and goodness has been severed. And then this creature becomes evil. The prophet Ezekiel takes up the same story, but gives a little more detail of what happened when the devil fell from his original place of glory and honour. It's in Ezekiel 28 from verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz and emerald chrysolite, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendour. So I threw you to the earth. Now, the reason we've taken a few moments to consider this, these deep scriptures is that it helps to understand the thinking or the philosophy of the devil and why he tries to tempt Jesus in the way that he does. The devil is essentially full of himself. He believes that self-interest and selfishness, that's the true way to happiness and fulfilment. He believes that self-power or self-love are the very highest and greatest loves of all. He believes that everybody is ultimately motivated by self-interest. The moment the devil, Lucifer, opened that door to selfishness, he was, he was shaped by that corrupt philosophy. When he was beginning this selfish rebellion, he tempted Eve with the idea that Eve needed to put her own interests first that she should also become like God. So it's in Genesis 3 from verse 1. The devil said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. 
So the devil suggests that the Lord God lied. And that actually eating of the fruit was in Eve's best interest. Eve, latching on to the devil's way of thinking, eats the fruit because not only was it pleasing to her, but she now believed that the devil was right and that she could become better, in fact, become like God, even while rejecting God. This same philosophy is always present in every account of the devil throughout the scriptures. In the very oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, the book begins with the devil coming into the courts of heaven to suggest that the only reason that Job serves the living God is because Job is paid to do so, that Job is acting out of selfish reasons. So when we come to the confrontation between Jesus and the devil in these earliest stages of the work of Jesus, we can see the kind of thinking that the devil deploys. It's there in Matthew 4 from verse 1. Jesus was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift up their hand, you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Notice how the devil begins. Jesus is hungry. For the devil, this is a very simple situation. Jesus has all the power in the universe at his disposal, so he should use it to satisfy his desires, to please himself. If Jesus is hungry, then he should just turn the stones into bread and please himself. Yet, that is the very opposite philosophy to Jesus. Jesus has an extremely different view of power, as we'll see in the coming studies, but he also has a totally different view of self. For Jesus, true life and glory and fulfilment are found as we completely forget ourselves and are caught up into the life and light and will of the living God. For Jesus, we find our lives when we lose our lives. So Jesus simply re replies that it's better to die of hunger than miss out on the life of God. Human beings do not live by eating bread, he says, but by the words that the living God speaks. Satan began his fall when he no longer trusted the words spoken by the Lord God, yet Jesus is utterly confident in those words. The name Satan means accuser because the devil loves to point out all our weaknesses and failures. That's how the devil gets so much power over us with guilt and fear. As we study the way that Jesus defeats the devil, we see that he removes the ability of the devil to accuse those who follow Jesus. So next, and with this, we come to the end of this, looking at this opponent. The devil wants Jesus to perform some kind of publicity stunt. If Jesus wants people to follow him and be the most famous man in the world, then it would be easy to do, with, to do that with so much power. And Jesus has armies of angels at his disposal. 
Surely Jesus could simply fling himself off the highest point of the temple and in front of thousands of people be carried to the ground by glorious angelic beings. And the devil even refers to the scriptures in a twisted way of supporting his philosophy. Well, if Jesus did that, then he would capture the headlines in every newspaper in the world. As far as the devil is concerned, fame and fortune are exactly the best way to serve self. Again, Jesus rejects this kind of philosophy. It's never possible to use the power of the selfless Lord God for selfish reasons. In the devil's final temptation, he throws all subtlety aside and goes straight for the bullseye. The devil will give Jesus all the power and influence that the devil has over the whole world with all its kingdoms, armies, media empires and business machines. If Jesus will simply acknowledge the devil as the true leader of reality, the one who deserves to ascend to the throne of the Most High. Yes, the devil is right back to the philosophy that began his career as the Prince of Darkness, raw self-glory. He wants to have the throne of God. Jesus rejects this also. The philosophy of the devil is unworthy of any worship at all. The philosophy of the Lord God, the philosophy of self-sacrifice and service, demonstrates that the Lord God is alone worthy of worship and honour. With the first new human Adam at the beginning of the world, the devil had only to use one temptation to succeed. With this second new human, Jesus, the devil fails with three attempts and has to withdraw in order to make new plans. But the devil doesn't give up. His philosophy of self-interest always has open ears with the rest of us. And the devil was able to ensure that plenty of the political and religious leaders regularly and constantly attacked all that Jesus was doing. 